We're good. He is Kadash, then Vigisim Kadashim. The Parsha opens with the, is, is speaks in the, in the beginning of the Parsha that you will sanctify yourself. Sorry, actually, it's at the end of the Parsha. Vigisim Kadashim, and you will be holy. Or maybe Bezek, Ved Kedusha, Sadmurat Zamach Tzadik, Ved Atayra, the Zamach Tzadik brings in Atayra Allah Pasuk, and his commentary on this Pasuk. Masha Amra Zal, what is the deeper meaning of his Kadashtim? You should sanctify yourself. And after you sanctify yourself, he is him Kedashim, then you'll be holy. So that Zamach Tzadik links this to a saying of our sages, which is found in Meseches Brachas. And there, the Gemara on page 55 says, on the Pasuk, which is found in the prophecies of Ezekiel. There, Ezekiel describes the third Beis HaMikdash. And he talks about the Mizbeach. And he gives his dimensions. And then he goes on to say, Mizbeach, HaMizbeach, Eitz, Vigoymer, the Mizbeach, of wood, etc. And the Pasuk finishes off with the words, Vayedaber Eli, and God spoke to me. This is the table before God. So the Gemara says, Kol's man Beis HaMikdash Kayom. As long as the temple in Jerusalem stands, Mizbeach Mechaped al Yisrael, the altar that consumed the offerings, brought atonement for the Jewish people. The Akshav says the Gemara, the meaning of this Pasuk is that now, Shulchan Nishalada Mechaped loy, a person's table serves to atone for him. Now, the truth is that in the commentaries in the Gemara, there are two interpretations here. One is the table that you study Torah at because usually people keep a safer, a holy book at a table. But the overriding opinion is it's not talking about a table that you study Torah at, because you can stand and study Torah too, but rather it's talking about the table that you eat at. And that's kind of where what the Tzermach Tzedek follows here. So we need to try to explain the connection between what the Gemara says and what this Pasuk says. The Pasuk says, sanctify yourself. Hiskadashtim. And vihiskadashtem, 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 then you'll be holy. So vihiskadashtem is a verb. It's a call to action. You, holy, yourself, make yourself holy. Vihiskadashtem, and then you will be holy. It's a machzadik links this to a pasuk that speaks about the mizbeach and the, t- and the table. And says that the mizbeach brings atonement, and now your table brings atonement. Now what does that have to do with vihiskadashtem, vihiskadashtem? So the Rebbe suggests that the connection to this could be understood by virtue of a different saying of our sages. This is also a Mesechet Brachot. This is actually two pages earlier. And interestingly, it's also brought in Eirat in, 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 in of the Tzermach Tzedek, in a different Mimer. So the, the Gemara says like this, V'hiska dashtem, you will hallow yourself, make yourself holy, elu mayim rishenim. These are the waters that are used to lave oneself before you eat. This is what we call proverbially washing for bread. That's Ve'yis Kadashtim. Ve'yisim Kedashim. The Torah's statement, de facto, you will be holy. Elu Mayim Achreinim. These are the water or the washing of the fingertips before Bechat HaMazon. Mayim Achreinim. Ani Havai Elekechem. I am the Lord your God. Zoi Bracha. This is the concept of blessing, which would, it would seem incorporates the blessing after eating, which is biblical, as well as the breast blessings prior to eating, which is rabbinic. But this is the concept of blessing. So v'hiskadashtem, you'll make yourself holy, refers to the washing of the hands before eating. V'hiyisim kedeshim refers to the mayim achrenim, the washing of the hands after eating. And then there's this notion of ani yeshem and the concept of brach. From this is understood that a person's table to be intact and perfect In other words, the notion of the meal, the feast, the repast at the table is only when there is holiness. And how do you have this holiness? So this holiness cannot be manufactured in the kitchen this holiness has to be manufactured in the dinette, the dining room. It's how you approach the meal. If you wash first, then the meal can be holy. If you wash after, then the meal can be holy. If there's the concept of bracha, then the meal is holy. Otherwise, then it's not holy. In other words, like this. 
There are different opinions as to what this table talks about. Clearly, the Tzemach Tzadik follows the school thought that the table talks about the concept of eating. On a literal level, just by the way, we're not trying to get people to eat an extra dinner. This is not about eating more. Rather, it's about feeding others. That's what the commentaries explain. It says, called Anybody who spends a lot of time at his table at a mealtime, will have a longer life. Sounds kind of weird. That's like a reward for sitting at the table, for, for chewing slowly. So the, the Mepharshim explained, because if you spend more time at your table, your table is a place where there's room for others. A person who eats, eats hit and run, he grabs somebody to eat as he's running into the car, he's never going to be able to invite anybody to join him for lunch. Why? Because he doesn't sit down to lunch. But a person who sits down to lunch can have somebody else sit down and join him. So in this way, people who don't have lunch will get lunch. The poor people will be invited to the table. That's why it says, Imagine if a person will eat on Shabbos, just knock off the meal, and go right away to study Torah. Which you could do, technically. Who, where will the guests go? Where will the people who don't have what to be for Shabbos go? This guy can't be bothered. He's going right back to the library. He's going to sit and learn Torah. So the idea of spending time at your table invariably ensures that others get to eat too. So that's the literal meaning, or how we understand, that it brings atonement. It's really the mitzvah of tzedakah. It's a mitzvah of hospitality. But because the Rebbe links it to this pasuk of v'hiskadashtim v'yisim kadeshim that speaks about the concept of laving, of washing hands before and after, and because the idea of according to the Tzemach Tzedek is also linked to this pasuk, so the Rebbe says, then this becomes the idea. Eating is a good thing. It's fine. Spend time. And when you spend time, you'll make sure others also are able to enjoy. However, in order for it to be a holy experience, a holy diet, then there needs to be the concept of natil chadayim and the concept of bracha. This is the point of what the idea of holiness. How does that get to holiness? Well, why holiness of all things? You could say a person could be holy about anything. If he jogs for a holy purpose and he wants to be healthy and he wants to be able to come and have the strength to study Torah, do mitzvahs, it's also holy. You could have... a Holy jogging shoes. What makes the table holy? How did that become the primary thing of holiness? So, so the Rebbe says, this is all connected to the concept of Kedusha, the way it's explained in our Torah portion. It says Kedushim to you. It should be holy. And Rashi says, ah, holy. What is the meaning of holy? Why in this Torah portion suddenly are we discussing holiness? Everything we do is holy. I mean, the Torah is holy. All the mitzvahs are holy. Eating matzah is holy. So what is, when God comes along and says, I want you to be holy now, what do you want us to do differently than we were doing up until now? We got a Torah, we accepted mitzvahs. So Rashi says, ah, Parshas Kedoshim, this is where we start talking about prohibited intimacies. This is where we have Purushim Tiyam and Harayis. You have to separate yourself from the idea of licentiousness. Umin Ha'aveda, and from the concept of contravening of God's will. And that's especially linked to the concept of food. Why? Because what we're speaking about, we say, to separate yourself from licentiousness, separate yourself from sin. What we're really talking about is a person who doesn't live a gluttonous life. We're talking about a person who, who to live a holy life is a life which is not steeped in self-gratification and in sensual and carnal pleasure. But a person for whom life rises and sets on carnal pleasure. How much fun can I have right now? Life's about who can have the most fun. And whoever ends life with the most fun, you know, wins the game. That's not the game of life from our perspective. The game of life from our perspective is whoever makes the biggest impact in this world wins the game, so to speak. How many people's lives did you change? How much Torah did you study? How many mitzvahs did you perform? How many times were you able to interrupt the, the, the coming and going of life and focus on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, on the Almighty in prayer? But food in and of itself has the ability to bring a person down. Why? Be'inyin ha'achilah, when, when eating isn't kiddabai, when eating isn't the way it should be, yachali is gamin yin veda. It can very easily become the segue into sin. Kemayim razal, this is in accordance with another, yet another teaching from the Gemara at Mesechah's Brachas. This is found on page 32. The Gemara says over there, mile kereisa zine bishi. Stuffing yourself, eating to the point of beyond satiation is a sin of sorts. The sin of sorts. And the Gemara goes, the Gemara has like four different ways where we get this from. And the, the, the point there is this. There are no atheists in the foxholes. Out of deprivation, nobody 
is uh, acts in a rebellious way. But when people eat, proverbially and literally, and they're sated, and they're full, and they're satisfied and happy, full themselves, this is when we end up in, in the situation of sin. So the Gemara says in general, overeating is a key to sin. It's a sin of sorts. Velochein, therefore. If a person is to be holy with regard to lifestyle, one of the first things in which a person has to show restraint is the idea of mealtimes, eating. That has to be somewhat of a separateness. You have to be able to pull back. You have to be able to push away from the table. Some people can't. They can't stop eating. How does a person have the koyach? That the meals should be something that he controls instead of being controlled by it. That the food is something that you're in charge of, not the food's in charge of you. How do you do that? So this is This is through the leaving. When a person washes his hands before, so the meal is purposeful. And then he makes a bracha. He washes his hands again, makes a bracha. So the idea of this is the concept of So up until this point, what the Rebbe has really done for us is shown us how the concept of the table, which it's a machzedek linked to a story of a mizbeach, which this is somehow connected to the Hizkadashtim, Yisim Kedeshim, is, is a perfectly logical progression. Because Vizkadashtim, Yisim Kedeshim is about washing. And because food tends to spin out of control, or people eating food spin out of control, and they lose all kind of restraint. And because it's important for a person to be able to get a grip on himself, how do you do that? Through so the concept of washing. And washing is alluded to now, there's another element over here. The element over here is, we didn't talk about this at all, is the idea of kapara, the idea of atonement. How does food affect atonement? The goes on to explain, the notion of atonement which comes through the table. He says first, Well, you're saying, what does that mean? How could your table bring atonement? So, Tzemach Tzedek says, Ah, uh, and how does the Mizbeach bring atonement? <clears throat> we said, just like the Mizbeach brings atonement, your table could bring atonement. So the question then becomes, okay, how does the Mizbeach bring atonement? You, you just say, I don't understand. How can meal times bring atonement? So what says, okay, fine, let's talk about the carbon itself. So the Gabi Mizbeach, with regard to the Mizbeach, Amr Razal, we have a famous teaching of our sages, which is found in Mesechet Kesubot, and it says over there, Mizbeach Maziach Gzerot, the Mizbeach, turns away evil decrees. In other words, it, it shows to protect us. It shields us. Umazin umechaviv. It sates and makes us, endears us to Hashem. And finally, mechaper avaynis. It atones for sins. It cleanses us of, of, of sin. Shemizem muvan sheikre shemazbeach yakapara. From the fact that we can see that maziach, mazin umechaper, that the primary function of the mizbeach is the concept of kapara. What it says in the Medrash that Mizbeach is a Rosh Tevis is an acronym. Mizbeach, the altar. What's the acronym for? So the Medrash says Mem stands for Mechila, forgiveness. Zion stands for Zuchot, or merit. Be stands for Bracha, the idea of blessing. And Ches stands for, for Chaim, for life. The Rosh HaTevish on Mizbeach, what's the first letter of the Mizbeach? The letter Mem. And that's Hainu'in a Mechila. That's forgiveness. Mechila, which is the idea of Kapara. So we see that the primary function of Mizbeach is the idea of Kapara. Shemikolza, Muvan, Sheikir, Yina Mizbeach, or Kapara Shabbat. The primary function of Mizbeach is the concept of the Kapara. So it is also with the person's table that that becomes a primary function. Now this needs, of course, to be understood. And so the next chapter is Ubir Ha'inyan. What does this mean? As he explains, to Gesund and the continuation of Maimer, the Hine, Klolis Inyan, Avedis HaKarbonis, the general concept of the Avedis, the service of Karbonis, Shalom is Beach, which is on the Mizbeach, Toichne, Hi Avedis Habirudin. The what is the content? What does it mean? You put something in the Mizbeach. Like, what happens there exactly? And the answer 
is that the world as we know it, as God created it, is a mixture. It's a mixture. Which means that in everything there is good and there is not good. And what our world needs is refinement. Because in order to have what's good, you have to be able to refine it. So you remove the toxins, the things that are not good, and then what do you end up with? You're left with the good. That's called refinement. When you pull fuel out of the ground, if you put it straight into your car, in a very short amount of time, your car will clog and essentially die. Why? Because the fuel is full of toxins. And the sediment of the toxins is going to destroy the engine. So what do they do when they pull fuel out of the ground? Crude. crude. What do they do to the crude? Make it into they make it into refined fuel. How do they do that? They refine it. And there's a number of different things. The simplest method of refinement is actually burn out the toxins. Those, those, those countries that charge us have no problem with emissions. They have no problem with, with the CO4 or whatever it is. They can burn whatever they want. Nobody says anything to them. Then it comes here and they make us some sugar. So they burn it off. And then and they actually cleanse it. You go to the gas station, you got three different kinds of gas. Why do you have three different kinds of gas? Because one of the gas, the simple gas, the 87, has gas. It's got sediment. So they don't charge you as much. Because the sediment is like, not good for your engine. And besides the fact that it's not good for your engine, you're getting stuff you can't use. Then you have 93, 91, 93. They're the highest level. That's, that gas is very refined. So there's less gas coming out of the crude. It's better for your engine. Drive a fancy car. You want to make sure you're buying good gas because you want to make the car last. At the same time, though, because the refinement process went through more refinement, what happens is there's less of it. The more we refine something, the less of it there is. And this is just a silly example. But the same is true with regard to flour. It's about getting rid of the bran, refining things. People will tell you the bran is actually good for you. That's fine. The point is, though, it's not. They can be refined. And then you can super refine things. Everything from, from vodka to gas, from flour to diamonds to gold to, to precious metals, everything needs refinement. That's the way the Abish created the world. He created a world that requires refinement. Now, if it's like this in a physical and material sense, it's a simple logic that it must be like this in a spiritual sense. Because the yeah, material... Mizbeach, a refining process? The ref, mizbeach is a refining process. It's exactly what it is. That is, it's a refining mechanism. And here's the interesting way this refinement goes. Since it's not physical refinement, so physicality requires the notion of being on-site. You can't kind of refine something long distance. It doesn't work that way. But you can perform spiritual refinement for something even though it's not here. So the Mizbeach, it says, takes one animal, and that animal, through its refinement, ends up elevating the entire animal kingdom. One fistful of flour and ends up elevating the entire kingdom of, of vegetation. One handful of salt, it ends up elevating the entire kingdom, the mineral kingdom. And of course, when people are involved in doing this, the Koyan representing B'nai Yisrael and B'nai Yisrael ultimately enriching the lives of all humanity. And we have many examples of this, like the famous thing that on Sukkot, we bring offerings on behalf of all the nations of the world. So we're affecting a refinement. And the refinement process has a much bigger impact. It's a big footprint, if you will. It's not just localized. So this could be like, for example, when a person is in a good mood, it affects even his feet. You walk differently, you jump differently, you're able to dance. So your feet are lifting because you're in a good mood. In a good mood, like physically, it's very hard to identify what exactly happened in your brain is a good mood. Maybe it's a chemical called serotonin. Maybe it's like, like something very refined, in a tiny, tiny, almost microcosmic fashion. There's a change, and that tiny change in the brain affects a change in the whole body. When a person's happy, everything goes differently. So the Mizbeach, the Yerushalayim is like the head of the Mizbeach, is the brain. The base of Megdash is the brain. So in the base of Migdash, when things are good in the base of Migdash, it affects the entire body, ultimately, which is the whole